My name is Neta Bakol. I'm a professor of astrophysics at Princeton University. The solar neutrino experiment started by John Bacall and Ray Davis with a very simple fundamental questions to test how the sun shines. It was believed for a while, uh, not for that long, that the sun shines by nuclear reactions in the center of the sun where it's very hot. But it was never tested. So when you, when you have a theory, it's never sure that that's exactly how the sun shines, and by the way, how all the stars, or most of the stars, shine. And that's a very basic fundamental question. So what John and Ray uh, decided to do in the early 60s was to test that theory that the sun and other stars shine by nuclear reactions in their core. And that was, of course, very difficult because we cannot see the core directly. So they had to figure out how to test this uh, scenario, that nuclear reactions in the center of the sun power all the light that we see from the sun. The sun is a ball of very hot boiling ga gas, mostly hydrogen, helium, and some other elements. On the surface, it's only about like five, 6,000 degrees. The sun you can model because it's a ball of gas, very complicated, but you can model it to how the temperature and the density go all the way to the core. You cannot see the core. That's where the nuclear reaction is supposed to happen, where it's very hot, hot plasma. The temperature is supposed to be about 15 million degrees based on the model. Very, very hot. That's where nuclear reactions like hydrogen bomb, hydrogen, uh, atoms, hydrogen nuclei, combine together and release a lot of energy. And that energy powers the sun. That was the model. The details were not exactly known. But during these nuclear reactions, and we cannot see the nuclear reactions themselves, we cannot see anything from the center of the sun, but n these particles are called neutrinos are emitted dur uh, during some of these nuclear reactions. The neutrinos don't interact much with matter, and they go, the only particle that goes through the sun, from the center to the outside, all the way to the earth, without too much delay. Mm -hmm. And what they wanted to do is to detect these neutrinos. Mm -hmm. So John calculated, John Bacall, calculated a detailed model of the sun all the way from the surface to the center, calculated all the nuclear reaction rates, how many neutrinos are produced, what energy, how many neutrinos could be detected on the ground in an experiment that Ray Davis wanted to build. And he said, yes, you can build this experiment because we expect that you will detect a few of these neutrinos per year, per month, per year. Mm -hmm. And that's how the, it all started, is by detecting the, nucle the, the neutrinos that are expected uh, to be produced during nuclear reactions if they happened in the sun. If they didn't detect anything, based on John's model calculation, means the sun doesn't shine by nuclear reaction. So it was just very basic, very fundamental, in a way a very simple question, but very complicated to get the answer. So the whole discovery of neutrino oscillations and the fact that neutrino have mass was based on a combination of what John calculated for the sun. How much do you expect to see from the sun? And then how many Ray Davis de actually detected? The fact that he didn't agree is the solution to the, the problem, to the solar neutrino problem, is the discovery that neutrino oscillates and they have mass. Without having the theory, without knowing how much the sun produces or expected to be detected, just finding a few neutrinos 
won't tell us anything. You just found something, but you don't know what it means. Mm -hmm. So John's contribution, that, you know, from the beginning, from the 60s, it lasted like 40 years because of all the different uh, additions that were made, was crucial for the discovery. Without it, there would not be discovery. You detect some neutrinos, and you don't know what it means. Mm -hmm. That was a wonderful, wonderful relationship, uh, again, for... 40 years, over 40 years. They started working together, again, John with the theory and Davis, the experimentalist, in the early 60s. John was only in his late 20s then. It was just before I met John, he started making, a couple of years before I met him. So he was in his late 20s. Ray Davis was uh, older. He was uh, a chemist, built things. And they got together because John's expertise in the theory of these nuclear reaction types. And uh, they got together, they put their minds together scientifically to see what can be done. Davis was not sure he could build this experiment or, or that he could detect anything because nobody knew how much neutrinos would come from the sun or how much he could detect. So he didn't know that he could even build it. It was based on John's calculation that showed that Davis can, it really gave the go ahead for a Davis experiment. Without it, Davis would not have built this experiment. So they got together on that science that they were both very excited, they were both very young, very ambitious, and very excited about it. So that's how it started on the science. And they were together, even though John was a theorist and Ray was experimentalist chemists, you know, they worked together on both combining the experiment and the theory. John wanted to understand the experiments and how Ray got everything out, and he visited Ray Davis many times here. Ray Davis was interested in the calculation and how to improve it. So they worked together beautifully as colleagues over all this time, all these decades, and they became very, very close friends. So they became, you know, close scientifically. They became close personally. We would go and visit Ray Davis and his wife, Anna, who lived near Brookhaven National Lab. Uh, we would go there. Ray Davis was an avid, um, uh, he had a boat. He would love to go, a uh, sailing boat. We would go with them on their sailing boat. We spent time with them. They would come and visit us. So we became close friends uh, with the Davises. And that friendship and scientific collaboration just continued for four decades. He was so, uh, so excited with all the experiments because what happened was that after Davis results, so they came up with the John came up with a prediction in around 1962, 63. The experiment started actually around 64. So John's prediction enabled Davis' experiment. Davis built the experiments, got the data. They looked at it together. The, resu the initial results from Davis' experiments came very quickly in 68. So it took a few years. The results came in. So, you know, didn't take very long. But it was a big surprise. Davis' results found three times fewer neutrinos than John's prediction, three times less. Many people said, ah, factor of three, maybe Davis, it was such a difficult experiment, he can only find a few of these, uh, a few of these atoms, a few of these nuclei that change during the neutrino interaction. Maybe he couldn't get all of them out. It's only a factor of three. Or they said, well, John calculated model of the sun, but how accurately can he really calculate the temperature in the center of the sun? And if you're off by a few percent on the temperature in the center of the sun, you're off by a factor of three in neutrino. So it's not a big deal. So many thought it was not a big deal. But John and Ray both were very determined, very good scientists, very visionary, very persistent. And they both kept checking and rechecking and improving their part. So Davis kept improving 
the experimental side and the detection and tested it. He put in some fake, I mean, some source of neutrinos to see, and he saw he could get all of them back. And John helped with all of that just this by discussing it. He didn't do the experiment, but he helped the discussion. And John kept improving and improving and adding more physics into the model and kept showing that he seemed that it was all correct. And they both felt that this factor of three was real, was not a fake. So John kept thinking, how far though can we test it? Because Davis kept showing factor of three continuously less than what John was finding. So John has advocated or proposed new experiments that will test different parts of the nuclear reactions in the center of the sun, because it's not just one reaction, it's a set of reactions. And Davis was sensitive to one or two of these. John proposed to test some other parts of the, some other reactions. Those experiments were created and John advocated for it all along. So he was really in a leadership position to advocate and talk to his colleagues. So Japanese started the Kamiokanda experiment to taste some other parts of it, then a Russian experiment, then a German experiment, each to test different parts of the nuclear reaction rate. And the amazing results when those started coming, that they all differed somewhat from John's prediction, but in a different way than Davis experiments was. Then it became very clear to him and to others that the problem was not like originally many physicists thought, either in the Davis experiment that Davis couldn't extract everything because others found other results that differed from Davis. And that it was not in the solar model because the difference was not in the same direction always. It was different times. So it became clear to John that the problem was not the Davis experiment, was not the solo model, it was something in physics. And that, in fact, was the solution, that, that what people, what physicists believe neutrinos were, no mass, just single neutrinos, was not the case. So the physics was wrong. So that was a huge discovery. And it became clear to John and to Ray once the new physics uh, results of neutrinos started coming, coming up. And then, of course, eventually, 2001, it was proven so by the Sudbury neutrino observation when they measured all the neutrino types, which none of the others could do. And it, the results was bang on on what John calculated for 40 years, from 1960, exactly what he predicted for the total sum of neutrinos. So that was just an amazing, amazing story. And that's how science is done. It's, you know, you never know, and you sometimes struggle, and it takes decades, years or decades, and there are questions, and many people questioning you all along, questioning why Davis experiment, questioning John's calculations. And if you are a very good scientist, you keep checking, you address all those scientific questions, you check them, you recheck them, you improve the calculations or the measurements, you create new experiments to test further, and that's what they did. And at the end, if you persist, you find some amazing results, and that's what happens in this case. So it's one of those physics experiments and theoretical uh, work that is frequently brought as a model of how science should be done, the beauty of science, that at the end, science wins, the data wins. If you check your data, if you check your model, if you create new experiments to double check it, at the end, you get the right result. And that's what happened. It just took forever, it took 40 years, but, but it, it got the right result at the end. Well, the, his goal was to 
get to the truth of it, even though m many top science scientists, many top physicists, did not believe that there was a problem. The solar neutrino problem was not a problem. Many said, ah, oh, factor of three, that's not a big deal. It's probably within the uncertainty. Uh, he checked and rechecked everything and believed that there was a problem there. And he was persistent. He loved the solar neutrino experiment. He worked in many different fields and led many different fields in astronomy, dark matter, uh, galaxies, and uh, uh, other things. But his love was in the solar neutrino problem. And he was a leader that led all the theoretical work. And he just wanted to get to the truth of it. And he did. So I work in, in astronomy and cosmology. The cosmology, the field that tries to understand the evolution of the whole universe. So my work encompasses uh, looking uh, at the distribution of galaxies, which are collections of billions of stars, like our own Milky Way galaxies. Now we know that there are billions and billions of galaxies out there in the universe. So I work in understanding, measuring, and determining the structure of our universe. How are these galaxies distributed on the large scale in the universe? Because they are the main building blocks of our whole cosmic, huge cosmic universe. How are they structured? How are they distributed in the universe? And we find that they are all clumped together in clusters of galaxies and in filaments and then there are voids of galaxies. There is a big kind of network structure of these galaxies. So uh, I, I work on that. We determine some of these structures. We compare it with understanding of how the universe could form such structures. Uh, we determine the properties of these structures. And we also determine how much, how does these structures tell us about what the universe contains. So the universe contains, in addition to just galaxies and the billions of stars, a lot of dark matter. And that's some of the beautiful experiments being done now to try and detect dark matter. But it came from astronomy. And I work on determining how much, one of the main things that we have found is how much dark matter exists in the universe. What is the density of dark matter in the universe? Because we cannot see dark matter directly in astronomy, but we can see its influence on the motions of stars and galaxies in the universe. From that, we determine how much dark matter. So we were one of the first to determine that the total amount of dark matter in the universe is much less, only like 20% of what's called the critical mass density in the universe the amount of dark matter that needs to exist to stop the expansion of the universe. So we have much less than that. So we work on the determination of the mass density of total dark matter mass density of the universe. And now I work on determining how is the dark matter distributed in the universe, which is all very fundamental and exciting topics. I think one of the questions that I've been working on uh, for quite a while is determining how much, ma ma how much dark matter, what is the mass density of the universe is, because that question is fundamental. How much gravity exists in the universe? Will the universe expand forever? Or will there be enou enough gravity, mass, dark matter, to stop the expansion and maybe even get the universe to re-collapse and re-collapse eventually in a big crunch. That question was not known for many years. And uh, we used over the last maybe couple of decades different methods in using galaxies and large scale structure of the universe to help constrain how much dark matter exists. And that has now been definite. We found that, like I say, the universe has only about 20% of the critical mass density, means less than the critical density needed to stop the expansion. Therefore, the universe would expand forever. 
And that result has now been confirmed by many uh, more recent observations that determine it much more carefully. But that was an open question for many years, so I'm very excited to know that we determine it among the first to determine it, and it's now confirmed, and this is the mass density of the universe. And what is one yet unanswered question that you'd like to have answered in your lifetime? I think probably the one that I find the most puzzling and interesting uh, open questions in cosmology is what is this dark matter particle? We expect that those are some new type of particles, whether it's this weakly interacting uh, massive particles or something else. We don't know, we have not detected it. And I find it just amazing that most of the mass, most of the gravity in the universe is composed of these particles and we are surrounded with all of it. And after decades of trying, we still have not detected this particle. And that is a very fundamental uh, question that I think will be most important to find out. What is a dark matter particle? A federal galaxy, our own, the Milky Way galaxy. We live in it, we study it in detail. It, we can study the supermassive black hole in the center of this galaxy very well. And the main thing, it's our home. I think this is a very moving visit to see uh, uh, the lab where, Ray Davis lab where solar neutrinos have been first detected. Well, John visited many times with Ray. Well, John produced his results, Ray produced his results. That this place produced this amazing discovery. So it is moving, it is personal, it is inspirational. It's inspirational to think that, as John frequently said, that sitting here at the bottom of a mine you know, in the dark and, you know, underground, so deep underground, you can create an experiment that will tell you what's happening at the center of the sun and find new properties of neutrinos that nobody expected. I mean, that is kind of mind-boggling to think. So it's, it's very moving, it's very inspirational, and it brings me back to, I don't know, 60 years ago when they first started this experiment. And our, our young days of John and mine, uh, you know, as, as a young couple, starting uh, at that time, because that's roughly when I met John. And it, it is, so it's all, all combined together, the science, the personal, the inspiration, and the emotion. It's all combined together. Oh, that is critical to have underground uh, labs because you cannot do this important experiments, whether it's trying to detect dark matter in the universe, like the experiments being done here uh, at, at uh, self, or the neutrino uh, experiments being done at self. Out in, in the open, there's too much background. So if we really want to understand what are, what makes up most of the universe gravity, what are these mysterious dark matter particles, you need to know, go underground in order to detect it. There, there's no other place that you can do it to shield yourself from all the background, all the neutrino experiments. And it's critically important for the United States to have a national underground laboratory to do this very important scientific work that really change our understanding of the universe. It's, it, and John was, very strong advocate pushing to have a national American uh, US underground facility to enable such important experiments. I just want to wish everybody working here really all the best and good luck and good support from the American US government and other resources to support this really important underground labs and all the very important experiments that are being done here because this is the way to figure out what is our universe like.
uh, without it, we, we, we will not be able to do that. So important to keep supporting it, doing the experiments, all the physicists, technicians, everybody that is working uh, in these laboratories are doing just a terrific job in constructing and building and analyzing all the amazing data that comes through. And Davis' experiment is, is a, 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 an example of how important it is, what kind of amazing, unexpected discoveries can come from that. Important to keep it going. Thank you.